Two million pounds of steel and coal harnessed together furnish the power that drives Rio Grande's scenic limited westbound over towering continental divide. Through rugged Tennessee Pass, 10,240 feet of elevation in a land of Herculean proportions. Down a granite vertebra of the backbone of the North American continent into color-splashed canyons mottled with spruce and pine. Evergreen sponges that retard the rush of water from eternal snows. Mile after mile, our route parallels the Colorado River, a swift-flowing palette that catches the myriad colors of nature's endless parade of beauty, a surging guide that leads us across Colorado's boundary at dusk into Utah. Now, a mysterious land of empurpled distances, shadow-tinted by a retreating sun. Rhythmic wheels symphonize a lullaby of flanges and rails, desert night and sky spangles, past small way stations, on to a dawn destination, Arches National Monument, which is reached from a tiny desert outpost, Thompson, Utah. Aboard the Scenic Limited again, through ebony darkness, into Utah's great Carbon County coal region. Bound for Castle Gate, imposing entrance to the Wasatch Plateau. Gray sandstone projections atop the canyon ridges guard the bituminous wealth of this section. Enough coal to supply the entire United States for 250 years. It is estimated almost 196 billion tons of coal remain to be mined and the fact that 45% reaches out-of-state markets makes for an endless parade of coal-laden gondolas up and down mountain graves. The coal resources of Utah are enormous, with one-fifth of the state underlaid with this valuable combustible mineral. Utah coal, black magic that fires the furnaces of progress. Lunch, a pleasant interlude, tasty dishes spiced with fleeting scenes. Up to Soldier Summit, over 7,000 feet high, the crest of the Wasatch Plateau. Here the railroad reaches its highest Utah elevation and what was once the scene of Indian warfare is now a busy mountain crossroad. Passengers and commerce moving east and west over a modern double track system, a quartet of steel arteries reaching into infinity. We're over the hump and it's down to Provo, Utah's third largest city. A scene of great agricultural activity, Provo testifies to the reclamation of the desert. Our next objective is the mine headquarters of the Utah Copper Company, for many years the scene of feverish activity. Small cable trams provide an inclined ascent for several hundred feet, permitting us unrestricted vision of this little town. So vast are the mining operations here, it is necessary to board yet another vehicle, this time the caboose of a supply train, to see the world's largest open-cut copper mine. What a spectacle. This man-made wonder, an immense amphitheater-like quarry, terraced with 23 benches or working levels, each 70 feet high. The mine covers an operating area of 475 acres. It is 1,600 feet from the crest to the floor of the pit, which is encircled with miles of railroad track, over which electric engines haul ore cars of 80 and 100 ton capacity. First prospected in 1862 by United States soldiers, it remained dormant until the period of the Spanish-American War, 
when Colonel Daniel C. Jackling, realizing its great possibilities, made his preliminary efforts to create this awe-inspiring project. Like the fabled ventures of Egyptian pharaohs, this great enterprise, too, depends upon manpower, and more than 4,000 are employed when operating at peak capacity to handle a single day's output of 70,000 tons of low-grade copper ore. Enough mineral in one day to fill 824 cars, equivalent to a train almost five miles long, and that's mining. Terrace and trestle cross and recross this massive mineral basin. Until 1938, more than 266 million cubic yards of material was removed from this enormous mine, a staggering feat, exceeding the total excavations for the Panama Canal by more than 20 million cubic yards. A blasting preliminary is the loading and shooting of spring holes, a prologue to the stupendous multiple explosions. Mechanical molds, electric churn drills burrow into the earth, a chain of holes each approximately 23 feet in depth. Fearless powder monkeys nonchalantly pack these small but mighty capsules of ammonium nitrate powder into the apertures. Enough explosive to literally move the earth. And here it goes! What an explosion. Thunder over Utah. 125,000 tons of mineral dust. A veritable smoky curtain of copper. This man-made earthquake is the signal that sends empty ore cars on their way to load up. And it becomes necessary to lay whole sections of new track in order to reach the debris. 29 electric shovels stab the earth. Giant steel dippers scooping six to seven tons of rock at a time, completely filling an ore car in the record time of five minutes. Yes, they move mountains here in Utah. And the parade of rock-laden cars starts for the Magna Mill. the precipitate is 89% copper and is ready to be transported to the smelter for the fiery baptism which will convert it into solid metal. We leave the precipitate and follow the ore to Magna Mill where we witness an amazing operation. A carload of rock turned upside down like a toy in a powerful rotary dumper. Sharing our fascination is Colonel Daniel C. Jackson, active head of this stupendous copper enterprise. Tons of rock are catapulted into the crusher, looking for all the world like a huge coffee grinder, creating an ear-splitting roar. Conveyor belts carry the grist from crusher to crusher, each chewing the ore a little finer until mechanical classifiers divert any remaining coarse bits to the battery of ball mills. Pulverized to a fine consistency, the ore is mixed with reagents, becomes a pulp-like mixture, and is delivered to the flotation machines where the copper mineral is floated away from the worthless gang or rock and recovered as copper concentrate and then made ready for delivery to the smelter. Here, gold, strangely enough, is a byproduct of copper, being caught in valuable quantities in these launders through which the mill tailings flow. Efficient mining and smelting of low-grade ore makes for continuous activity at the massive Garfield smelter, where more copper matter is produced than at any other place in the world. From one steel volcano to another, the fiery copper lava is drawn, rejecting all waste material or slag. The slag is skimmed off. It is poured into special metal dump cars. Then it is rushed to the slag pile, where it cascades down the side of an ever-increasing mountain of waste. Purged and purified, 
The stream of molten copper is molded into 450-pound blocks, cooling streams of water playing on the hissing, steaming oblongs. Leaving Ogden, western terminus of the Rio Grande Railroad, we are thrilled again with the prospect of going places, this time to the throne of a desert empire, Salt Lake City. More than 90 years ago, covered wagons freighted with courageous men and women forced balky oxen over torturous desert routes. What a contrast. Steel-covered wagons powered with the might of thousands of steam oxen thunder over flashing rails. Carefree, speedy transportation, safeguarded all the way by Cyclopean green and red eyes. Ever alert signal towers, the mechanical mounted police of the steel highways. On we roll, past fertile acres shaded by towering peaks of the Wasatch Range. On to Salt Lake City, miracle metropolis that rose from dead desert sand. Objective is just a matter of moments. Air brakes gently slow our train, while alert porters make ready to empty passenger crowded vestibules into the busy Rio Grande station. Salt Lake City, commercially and culturally the lodestone of the West, a tribute to the foresight and wisdom of its founder, Brigham Young. To fully appreciate Salt Lake City and understand its unique historical background, requires far more time than the few brief hours we have enjoyed. Hours amongst people friendly and hospitable. But we face the inflexible reality of railroad schedules. And it's back on board. This time, the panoramic, eastbound over the Moffat Tunnel scenic shortcut. Dreams do come true. Brigham Young's prophecy is fulfilled. Utah is the desert empire.